Yeah, well. Recording has started. All right. So welcome to the um, the docs meeting of the OKD working group meeting. So hi Eric and hi everybody and I'm going to put everybody on camera today just so that we um, there and um, I'm sort of working through um, the recap blog post. Um, I've got a preliminary one um, uh, in the um, OKD.io blog this morning um, and most of the main stage um, videos have been uploaded. Um, and separated into their individual talks. So there's one by Charo, one by Vadim, one by um, Jamie, um, and one by um, Joseph. So those are there now, plus the one long, full-on, unedited one. And there goes a dog behind Mike. I love this. I don't have a dog anymore, so I'm living vicariously through everyone else in Zoom land's dogs these days. Um, so that's happening. I just had, um, and he won't be able to join us, Jamie from UMich is, um, has another obligation at this time. I just did a chat with him. He's, I have run, completely run out of disk space on all of my hard drives and the session, um, our sessions, the track sessions were very long. So I managed to get the home lab one edited and up and then ran out of disk space completely and now so it's been one, besides losing internet access, I ran out of disk space on my editing machine. It's been a, it been a fun couple of days. But that said, um, I got the home lab one up, I just retweeted it, and there should be a blog post shortly on okd.io. Um, I just have to add in the links to the individual videos as they go up. And um, Jamie from UMich is going to um, edit the, um, the, the other three sessions and upload them to YouTube for us. Um, and I am forever grateful for that. Um, and you can see what we're doing. The question um, that I wanted to discuss today, and if other people have things on the agenda, let me know, um, was now that we've um, done the workshop and there's a number of stubs um, and Eric and Robert, I don't think you were there this weekend. I didn't see your names on the weekend workshop and I'm not gonna hold it against you. Um, <laughs> but uh, Mike, if you can um, share your screen and show, um, walk through the docs on the deployment and configuration guide where they are now, um, so that Eric and Robert are up to speed on that. What I'd like to talk about is where they should live. Um, and now that we've done that, and what else we need to do to them to kick off this. And then the other thing I'd like to talk about is reviewing all of the docs that we have after we have this first conversation um, and trying to come up with a cohesive, coherent documentation strategy for OKD. Um, and I've had a lot of coffee, so I'm gonna try and not talk too much today, um, which is impossible because it's me. So we did have um, a few pull requests against it, I believe, um, during the thing, but I think it was all from known entities. Did we have any at all from um, attendees? Three, yeah, so probably not. So I, we sorry. didn't, yeah, you're- I just you're, need to unmute my mic there, sorry. Yeah, no, we didn't, uh, it was just Shri and Jamie and uh, Vadim put up PRs. All right, and I think the one that Charo did, um, if you go to it, is a good example. Charo, I think, just put in a stub for his home lab that reached out to his um, blog post. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he created a stub, and he didn't create a PR yet. I saw that, um, oh boy, now I don't know where it is. He would link to me like a gist, I think he had put together. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, he didn't. He didn't put a PR up uh, for here yet. Yeah. So what I, I'd love to ask you to do, Mike, is if you can put in a stub for home labs, because um, there's and there's so that we have a um, a stub there, and because we in the workshops we ended up with I think three different approaches to home labs: Craig Robinson's, uh, Shree's, which is um, very specific to his piece his work, and um, Vadim's. So I think that was. I just noticed we got two bare metals there. I'll need to clean that up a little bit. Yeah. Um, so did you want to see like a top level home yeah. lab? 
Okay. Because what it seemed like what people had been doing so far, what I tried to encourage was people were, were going into bare metal and putting their, you know, they putting their be. username with yes, their deployment. Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably not like, um, great documentation. Um, process. So it's, there still needs to be some cleanup and editing on this, um, on these configuration guides so that they have uh, some uniformity to them. Um, and, and to be quite honest, um, I'll, I'll say what I said to Jamie earlier. Um, I, we were looking at the OpenShift.com blogs and the home lab for 4.5 that Craig Robinson did that I reposted on OpenShift.com um, had is still in the top 10 of blog things that get hit on OpenShift. So the wording, the wording home lab is um, an attractant to um, developers and um, more so I think than bare metal. Um, and I, I think bare metal is more along what Andrew and Justin Pittman did, that it might be um, their and I think he also has some stuff to give us um, to track down. Um, so so oh, I this think is this is the link. Sorry. Yeah. yeah so that's that's Charo's um, stuff. So we have some still some work to do here before it's um, ready to pull into another repo and make it live and breathe. Um, yeah. So my my druthers is that the bare metal one maybe get extended to be bare metal with I think he used libvert. Um, yeah. So that when you said that yeah like uh, Jason or Justin and um, now I'm blanking. Um, yeah, their and Andrew um, their their lab. Yeah, I wouldn't have called it bare metal so much as I might have called it libvert. You know, because that's really they were exercising the libvert pieces of the. Of the yeah. cluster to build there. Now, now did did they use overt uh, this time uh, as on top of that, or I, I didn't get to see that because uh, I was being the straight man for Charo. Yeah, um, I did put the raw file up on um, YouTube, um, so I can share that. Let me just grab that. Just stay. Where I you I thought it was. I thought they said libvert, but I I mean I also joined late because I was at that session with you know Bruce and Charo. Yeah. So let me just. Um, yeah, asking good questions. Yeah, so I'm just going to... I, I was trying, at least. <laughs> I'm just going to go back in the chat, and I'm going to put a link. Oh. It's, it's unlisted, so, so don't share it quite yet. Everybody can take a look at This is Andrew's, and just skim past the first 10 minutes, because that's all them trying to figure out how to set up their screens. Um, and that's what um, has to be edited out. But um, that's the video if um, Bruce you want to look at it or anybody else wants to look at uh, it. So Diane I wanted to step back for a second though and, and go back to talking about the configuration note or guides uh, repo because I, I agree with you like you know the more I was thinking about it over the weekend and the more we're kind of like you know we started to get some pull requests in there you know yeah I one thing I would love to have is like a template that we could use we could kind of say here you know and and I'll look at the sections we have now, and maybe I'll just try and call out those sections and say you should have like a hardware section, you should have a section there. Yeah. Um, but then also like really the shape that this information is starting to take is yeah, it's much more like a community response. It's like here's how people in the community are deploying this, but I don't really see it resolving into like a set of like oh here's the one I pick and like. I'm going to follow yeah. this one exactly because right now it just feels very much like a, you know, like just community notes that people are throwing up there and saying, here's how I did it, you know. So if there's a way to make that more useful to the community, maybe by organizing it better or whatever, like I, I you know, I'm all ears for hearing about how we could kind of push in that direction. Well, there's two yeah, things I that, 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 that I wanted to say about that. One is, um, is, is you're absolutely right. Um, and a template uh, like in the README file at the beginning of the configuration, guys, what you know, what should be in your your stub um, or in your guide, and then to figure out the categories better. So bare metal should maybe 
or Andrews and um, Justin should get shoved into something called, I think it's Libvert. If you watch the video, you can see it there. Um, and I was also going to say this, and everybody can argue with me about this, is that I think it should live in the okd.io site um, rather than OpenShift um, origin or in okd land. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that is one is if it's in the OpenShift repo, it um, has connotations of officialness. Um, and it also means that we have to follow their guidelines for merging new content in um, and ask, their, ask the engineering team that owns the repo or bug Vadim or bug Christian, whoever has merge access. And um, frankly, I don't even want merge access on the OpenShift repo at this juncture. There are you know, thousands of customers relying on it. And if I screw up or I don't want my name on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for introducing some bug. Um, however, on the OKD.io site, I do own that. Um, and um, there are a couple other folks there. So if we move this and then we could format it any way we wanted, we could make it as beautiful as the porter.sh site. Um, we could do whatever we want. So what I, you know, and, and I would, not that I don't love you, Mike, but um, I would love to move it over there sooner than later um, so that people get into the habit of pushing stuff there, if that's okay. And Yeah, I'm totally happy, yeah. Yeah. And so um, I'm going to pause for a minute, and Bruce, you were about to say something, so I'll shut up for a minute. And then I'm going to ask Eric and Robert, because they're the newbies on this call, what they think was, about it. I was going to say, right, sorry, not to interrupt Bruce, but Robert had a question in chat, too. So maybe after Bruce, let's pick up Robert's question. Okay. Well, he, he can go first if you want. I, I'm not, uh, you know, standing on ceremony. Okay. Um, so Robert uh, had asked, like, what's the difference between the, the guides uh, repo that we're talking about now and kind of the official installer repo where, you know, you've linked to the UPI. So that those things you link to in the installer repo, those are actually artifacts that I believe are used during uh, by the installer to actually create the installations. The what this the repo that I created originally, we were just calling it notes because what we wanted to do was we wanted to collect information from people about what their clusters look like once they were actually deployed, right? So we wanted people to contribute like. I know I'm running vSphere and I followed the standard, you know, IPI installation and I ended up with this. But then maybe that that person says, but I also run vMotion in my cluster and I have all my storage set up in vMotion so that I can, you know, move disks between nodes or something, right? And then they might have a section in their thing about like, here's how I set up vMotion, right? And so the idea was to start getting all these user stories for the different ways that people are configuring their clusters kind of, I don't want to say day two, but once they get to day 1.5, you know, once they've passed installation, what does what does their configuration look like? And are there any customizations that they've had to do, you know, to kind of get there? So that was the intention on on creating these guides. Yes. And, um, and just, and so those, and those are maintained by the Red Hatters and the engineering team and not us um, for the most part. We can make, we can, if something's wrong, a grammar mistake, it's linking or what, you can make a pull request because you're, it's all out in the open. But the stuff that we own um, and the, the stuff that I can control or give Jamie and other people in the community access to merge into, it lives here in this GitHub repo. And if you're wondering what the CS stands for long time ago, customer success. So, um, and it's also where Project Quay lives and the OpenShift Commons website lives. Um, and uh, hopefully soon Commons will get lifted and shifted out of there and um, moved into, uh, if there, somebody's merging, migrating it to Drupal. It feels like um, going back in time. What is that movie with, um, where you go back to the future um part 21 that's like i'm going to a drupal site yeah right okay but uh anyway a long time ago i was a big player in the drupal community so hey i'll get to meet some old friends again so um that's all good but um but this is where i think we should lift and shift the guides to like we have the blog um the config community configuration and deployment guides um are here and that way um, and I'm going to keep putting in the porter.sh site 
is my um, Fantasy Island um, site for really good documentation. And I don't think I can wangle enough permissions for everybody in the community to do this under the OpenShift um, re open source repo. I, I know, I know because I own it, I can do in the okd.io resource. So that's, and, and that will also, especially, and this is what, the way that Diane thinks, is if we put in a lot of stuff about home labs, like we have, you know, one of the guides is about home lab, that will help drive traffic to okd.io um, and get people, more people involved in the working group. Um, because um, to be, we, there, are, there are, I would say probably just shy of 500 um, people who have deployed OpenShift um, OKD or somewhere in the universe whether it's production or, or EDU use or, you know, or just your home lab, there's, there's a good chunk of people here. Um, and that, that's awesome. Um, and, and there's about just under 400 people on the OKD working groups. So the thing is to try and get them to come to the OKD.io as the portal into that links to everything. And um, and I think we can do that. Um, and I think the deployment and configuration. This is why I've been so hot on these doing the OKD marathon and then do the, these other things and getting up on YouTube um, is to keep driving awareness of OKD four. And it's been semi effective um, and probably as effective as the sales team at OpenShift wants it to be. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it it could be better. Um, and it could be easier to, to maintain. So um, what I was gonna, and, and now I'm gonna stop for a minute. So Robert and Eric, you are guinea pigs here today. I don't know where either of you are from, um, what companies, whether you're Red Hatters or not, but um, tell me what you think of that idea. Is that where you would go? You're the, I see the Red Hat sneaking out there, Eric, yes, um, behind you. Yeah, I have one over there. I'm just tilted the wrong way today. Um, so tell me what you think. Is that, am I thinking correctly about this? And you can say no, because I'm very good about saying, hearing no. So um, what I like is the idea to summarize all of the OKD related content on the OKD website. I also like that we have this new word OKD for the free and open source part of OpenShift because it is very, it sounds very different. And there's always this kind of confusion between the product and the actual open source project and having everything as OKD and getting the OKD letters more into the faces of people will also teach people more what is actually the difference and what is the upstream project basically. And um, yeah, with the documentation, I, f I feel like there's something where I want to help. So I'm personally very interested in the single node area. That's also why I bought ah. the Nook. And I was also in the workshop with Charo. And also afterwards, we had to have a call so he could help me get the last steps done. And I also made some changes to his scripts and would have some small changes that I would like to make to his blog post where I don't know where I can hand these changes in. And having a central place where we put all these documents is very helpful. And yeah, it's it's really a little bit a question. There's the OpenShift documentation that is on the OpenShift website, right? Then there are some things that we are now doing for the OKD stuff. And there's also, if you have a customer account, you have some customer documentation as well, right? And it's also not one-on-one -on -one, and there's also a little bit uh, a difference in focus between what is on OpenShift on the public OpenShift website and what is basically the yeah. uh, customer documentation where you need to have a subscription for. And um, it's it's probably a good idea that we have uh, a clear understanding what we want to have in each. And if I understand, uh, Mike, sorry, Mike is the correct name because it always says El Miko, so I'm always not sure how I should call it. Either one works, either works. Okay. Then, uh, then I call you Mike. And... Um, if I understand you correctly, what you basically want to show in the OKD documentation is like what are what is 
the result of what people are making out of the documentation, right? And there are also some individual adaptations and to present different scenarios, basically. Like um, in the past, we also had these kind of deployment scenarios that like a solution architect could bring to a customer that we maybe have something like this as a focus for the OKD page. That yeah. sounds reasonable for me, yeah. So, so no, no big no from my side at the moment. Okay. <laughs> so Robert, wh wh what's your perspective? Are you with Red Hat as well? I don't see a Red Hat behind you, so um, I, I have no thing. So yeah, I I have a Red Hat from a conference, but the girls are playing with it. Yeah, it sounds very nice, but I'm afraid how we can update or can the documentation in up to date state the whole time. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's a good good idea to put it like a block because if it's like a block, you know the date, you know how old the stuff is, and you know it's one year old. It doesn't work, maybe. Yeah. So. But but, but if it's put in a Git repo, it's not that clear for what version it works and works not. So I think, Mike, in your template that you're discussing. Uh, much like with the blog posts um, that um, we have, it has a date timestamp on it. Like it, that's one of the things, and you know it has t the ability to tag. So, what I, if you look at the README, and I'll just share share it to do something like if you can, if you don't mind me asking you to do this, is to to create sort of a template for what the should be in the guide. Because um, Robert, you're absolutely right. These things. One thing that I really despise is is documentation by blogging you'll always hear me rant about that because internally at red hat um we've had this i i've been at red hat now eight years and um we get a lot of brownie points and pats on the back for writing a good blog and um, just like craig robinson's home lab 4.5 blog is in the top 10 it's now completely out of date or not completely but just enough to make it nasty for someone trying to do it. So um, if we had a revision scheme and a, a freshness date in the um, in the documentation, I think that would help in the in, in if it were in the OKD so that people would it would trigger people instantly to go, this is release 4.5, this is the version of it, and then you could have sort of a bit of a hierarchy of that. And um, and then we could um, what do you call it when you retire something? Um, an older version, okay. but yeah, so we could retire. Deprecation. deprecation. Thank you very much for that word today. Word of the day, deprecation. I want to deprecate myself um, for a week and go on vacation. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, Robert, that's a really good point. Um, and as Bruce put in a link to yet another um, set of documentation, Red Hat is famous, I think, externally for like really complicated strategies for um, and every business unit within Red Hat, even though externally everybody thinks of us as the Red Hat and thinks we are totally coordinated on every product silo. Um, you you will find stuff like that, Bruce. He's, he's linked out to the redhat.com sysadmin Kubernetes cluster laptop um, link there, and um, which is, you know, another resource. But that is, um, I think, it sort of worked. Yeah, and is that one OC? I didn't open it up, but is that OCP and someone who has a subscription? Uh, no, 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 I think that I think that was an OKD one. Okay. Um, but uh, it was back in the time of beta. Yeah. Um, so it, and that, but and but I mean, it, it, if you look at the architecture that that he's using there, um, it's pretty similar to other guides. Uh, but uh, so maybe his. I mean, I, 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 I'm just taking a look at it so as a good template. Is that what you're suggesting with this? Uh, well, uh, actually, I guess I had a couple of comments. Uh, uh, although uh, you know, Eric and Robert, uh, you know, made a number of excellent points uh, in that uh, things do quickly stop working. And um, you, you get to where um, often something, if you tried to follow it exactly, it wouldn't work for a variety of reasons. 
So, for instance, uh, you know, Charo has some excellent guides. Um, most of them don't work because uh, they're, they're based on versions of CentOS, which you can't get anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so he's, he's, uh, his cluster version, um, was based on a, uh, you know, CentOS, which had a, uh, CentOS minimal, which the last CentOS 8 version does not have. And then that breaks everything. Yeah. Uh, and, and so he, for about the last year, he's had a, uh, a note, you know, going to CentOS stream, maybe only six months. But, you know, of course, everybody is busy and that would be a, a big change. You know, like I'd, I'd be happy to have him help him work on getting it together. But now he's getting paid by Red Hat to do actually useful stuff. So that's going to impact his time, presumably. Yeah, but his wife is away for a week um, and he's been editing everything. So um, we take advantage of when our partners leave. Um, and, but, and that's But I think, nice. uh, just say, I, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, cause I've actually tried a bunch of, of those, uh, and, uh, sort of the first one that worked end to end was, was Craig's 4.4, uh, one. And I actually liked his architecture better than his switch to 4.5. You know, but, uh, and none of them quite worked, but, uh, but, uh, you know, with various changes, I was able to get them to work. And sometimes it's very minor things, like in his, uh, uh, one of the things I didn't look at when I was just doing it because it worked for a while was he, he put in a, uh, non-default network in his install config. And it turned out that that was the, uh, OpenShift SD in one, which on vSphere broke. And it took me about a week to go through and sort everything out and figure out that that was exactly what broke it. Mm -hmm. And it was actually just a random comment that, uh, Christian made that clued me into what the problem was, you know, which I discovered on Slack. So it was like just t total fluky luck. Yeah. So that, uh, I went through and did that, but, but, uh, and I think one of the things that, uh, now I'm, I'm making, this is an, another point in my rambling. One of the things that's difficult, uh, that people don't always clue in on is exactly what are the assumptions that, that one of these guys has. Uh, so for instance, on, VMware, uh, you have to dig down deeply through a guide before you know whether or not they're requiring command line access, uh, which uh, means that uh, if you're a developer, you're not going to have that uh, for your company because they won't give it, the, the system and people won't give it to you. If you have a home lab, then you do. Okay. And uh, sort of in passing, uh, Joseph, uh, commented that, uh, you know, he'd bought a, uh, you know, VMware license, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's the sort of thing that you probably want to make explicit up front if somebody's going to go through a guide that they don't find out at the end of it that they need this other license. And then they have to go through the hassle of getting that. So, you know, like I, I think that, uh, uh, and I guess Charo and his guys was pretty good up front saying what his assumptions were. Um, but that's not something, that, you know, I mean, like our assumptions are transparent to us. We're not always even aware of them. So uh, I think that would be sort of a useful editorial thing for somebody to look at these and say, okay, if you're going to go through this guide, this is what you're going to need to set up or this is who it's for. Yeah. And, um, target. But there are also some problems with that, right? Um, things also change all the time. Like with oh, Charo, yeah. I'm also discussing, like, maybe we don't need the bootstrap node with the next version of OpenShift anymore. And right. so that is already a big requirement that goes away. And maybe in, in this single node installation, we still create two VMs because we need the bootstrap node. Then maybe we don't even need to create VMs anymore. We, we can just install it pure bare metal without any VMs. So, you know, the expectations mm. change a lot and we don't know yet how they change because we are not sure uh, how the development will progress there. And nobody can really tell you, you know, the developer who's currently working on it, he also cannot tell you everything that he will discover during the development, so. Yeah. Right, but, but until, until it actually happens, it's not real, right? I mean, you know, like the, there are promises 
but they can be decommissioned in any version going forward, right? Like the, the single node cluster was at one point promised for 4.7. Uh, I think it's currently promised for 4.8. Um, we're I, I not will there commit yet. To that promise, I will commit to the 4.8. I have heard it from above. It's coming. So, um, the, the well, I saw an official Red Hat documentation for 4.7. I know you did, but you didn't hear it from me. If I oh, that's the difference. This is yep. the Diane commitment, the OKD commitment. Um, uh, mostly take it to the bank. Take it to the bank, right? And um, the Bank of Canada and um, the Bank <laughs> of Guam. There you go. Um, and it's recorded here. Um, so I'm going to move back again. So I think what I would like to ask Mike to do, and maybe work with Eric, um, because Eric was in the Home Lab one, is to create a template in the README file in the OKD.io, much like the blog post, and use Charo's home lab example, because we have his blog post, and retrofit Charo's into that, because Charo is pretty good um, at helping that, and see if we can get one, and, and folk, not, not, I shouldn't say home lab, single node cluster approach. And then also have, and we, we're doing it, have a depreciation tag too. So like, because we know that the single node cluster approach of Charo's is going to get depreciated. So some workflow of like, this is the timestamp, it's version 4.8. And if I share, I mean, see if I can share my screen again for a second. And so I'm not tucking out my bum here. Um, if, if it's okay to eat. this so this has a but didn't go down I didn't push it live yet if I go to github the go down to the readme here and it may you know right now create there's a little section here create a blog post um, do something similar to that um, for for the deployment guide. Uh, so like, uh, this is something I was gonna ask, like, I mean, we could convert the deployment guide into a GitHub page, you know, that's like Jekyll head matter is what is what's going on there. So like we could convert it into some sort of like, you know, static site generator if you want and use Git, and then we could just have like, you know, a GitHub pages site where all this information will be assumed in there. If, if you want to, if you want to go that route, we could certainly add all that marked on there. Yeah, um, I think, well, for me, and this is Diane, creating a blog article is, is wicked simple. Um, though I, I still, yeah. and if we know the structure of what we want and everything that's in those things, we should be able to do it. And I know Joseph has figured out all of the ins and outs of adding the blog into the, the OKD.io site. So it should be just rinse and repeat what we're doing for the blog, but using the structure. But the blog structure is slightly different. It's not as hierarchical. It's just. Yeah, I guess I guess that's the question. Do you like, so here's, here's what I got so far. Um, we want to move bare metal to home lab, change the bare metal stuff to home lab, um, make a template uh, for people to use to create their guides. And I've got a bunch of information here we want in the template, like, you know, date and version, prerequisites or assumptions, description, hardware, uh, target audience, and then some of the information we have already. Um, and then maybe we also want to move this at some point over and so, like, do we want to just, you know, I can, I can convert that to be, to look more like what the blog does structure-wise and use, like, one of these, you know, static site generators. I'll even, I mean, blog is just kind of a short way to say it, but really it's just a static site generator that's, you know, templating yeah. all this stuff together. I can add that in there if you like. Yeah, we already have that for the site itself. And, and Joseph went through the, the ink. so just reach out to Joseph. Um, we're using middleman and um, they're, I think they are, they upgraded to Jekyll, a later, a newer version of it. So that, I don't think we have to pick another one. I think we can use what we use for the site. Um, 
So, and we can have that conversation separate from here. But I think we already have what we need for the build process for the site to do it. It's just, um, I, would, I, I think I was thinking, the blog is very simplistic. It's not, um, it doesn't have the um, hierarchical structure that you have in yours, and I'm not positive, but we have it, it, it shouldn't be tough to do. But no, no, you could certainly configure it to bring all that stuff in. I guess that's kind of my question is like, do you just want the files in the guides repo to kind of match the format for the for the blog and then you could just pull them in later? Is that would that be the best way to do this? Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute. I got to think about that. Um, I am not a documentation specialist. Um, so um, I have an opinion. Um, I would like it to match the style of the OKD.io site um, and to use the header and everything else like that. But um, if there's a better way of doing it, and I'm going to, you know, I keep saying this is my fantasy island thing, um, I'll just go to border.sh and go to yeah, I'm not, I'm not super familiar with Porter. I haven't really used it much, no, but I mean, I've built a lot of documentation sites, so. Yeah, I have not. So I actually would defer to, to you to, to make a decision about that. This is sort of, this is, you know. Yeah, I, I would never go with that style, actually. It's too cutesy okay. feely for me. Okay, well, that's I, I prefer I prefer, I prefer the OKDIO OK style. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's all right. I, I, that, that's. It's a backhanded compliment because I created it. Um, so, I mean, the thing is, in some ways, the the guides are kind of different from even like Charo's blog and whatnot. You know, the guides are more just kind of data that you could look at and and kind of like use as a reference. Um, they're not necessarily formatted in a way that's meant to read like you know like Charo's posted because he obviously put a lot of time into structuring it that way. Um, so I mean I could take some I could take some first stabs at kind of organizing this stuff and then we can see where we get to and maybe you know kind of like assess at that point. Like my preference at this point would just be to have the guides as plain markdown and just kind of like doing what they're supposed to do, which is being a guide for how a certain deployment went. And then our next operation will be to figure out like, okay, do you want to pull those into a website somewhere? Do you want to put them on the blog? Like let's just yeah. get the data right and get kind of the categorization right. And then we can decide how we want to display it, you know, next, you know, at a later date. So what I would, I'm going to back myself up then, backtrack. So in your directory right now, in the README file, um, to put some best practices template information in there for people who are coming to your directory right now. Let's and keep, and I'm paraphrasing what I think I just heard you say. If you can do that, so like you should be have a date timestamp, a release version, assumptions, hardware requirements, and target audience. I think those would cover out a lot of things here. Um, should be in sections. Um, pick the pick whichever one you you like. I'm going to lean towards single node because I know Charo has time right now, and Eric was in the session, and um, it is one that we're going to have to depreciate soon. Um, so we'll go through the whole life cycle with it. So we'll, in my head, um, take that one and format it the way we think it should be. That like as the best, as the standard in your directory, in your repo. Um, and then we'll get Andrew Sullivan and Justin Pittman to do the same thing for the Libvert one. And then I can tap um, Joseph and um, Jamie to Charles do that. Charles is Libvert too. Say that again. I said Charles, Charles is also as well. Yeah. So that's you know that like. Uh, but the thing yeah. is, Libvert's a power. I, I, I think I, I, actually, you almost we're almost getting enough guides that you need a taxonomy, or a decision tree of what you want. Yeah. And, and I think that the the number of choices is actually not that great between them. So you could actually organize them fairly easily so that it would be a lot clearer. Um, you know, the, the sort of top decision is, okay, so uh, are, you, are you using a uh, cloud provider or your own hardware, basically? Uh, and, and if you're using cloud provider, which one, then you go off on the, on those, and it would be nice to see OpenStack in there somewhere. 
I mentioned that before. I'll mention that again. Yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll um, get there. I, I have but, an open uh, stack. And, and then uh, uh, the next sort of decision is is uh, uh, you know are you going UPI or IPI? If you're going UPI, how are you setting up the prerequisites? Uh, you've got choices for uh, DHCP, DNS, uh, uh, HA proxy sort of thing. Um, Load balancing is what I was trying to think of. Uh, and then next, are you using any automation tools? Okay, so I, I think that the main difference between Charo's and Andrew's was the automation types of things that you're doing. Uh, Charo's using bare bones uh, bash scripts, you know, fantastic, you know, goes way back into antiquity and still works. Uh, you know, other people using Terraform or, you know, on and on and on. Um, so could I ask and you, Bruce, do you, um, then you get to actually doing it. Yeah. Can I ask you to write up a taxonomy? Just, like, <laughs> just in a gist file. Just take that. Not that we're going to use that right now to frame the documentation, Mike, because I think right now, if we just got right. Sphere, Home Lab, Single Node, and maybe an OpenStack, um, you know, that would be a good start. They could, you know, they could be referencing other chunks of other people's documents and stuff, but um, but I think what you're discussing is, is sort of the decision, the taxonomy, the decision tree of which guide to use. Um, if you're a user, right. Yeah. Because you come in, you know, fat, dumb, and happy, and uh, I can, you know, refer to myself in that, uh, and you, ha you don't have a clue, so where do you go? Yeah. And you've got but 20 you choices. Yeah, so the guide to the guide is what you're talking about is, and then, Basically. you know, say, say you're using a cloud provider and um, you want to do um, UPI and you want to use Libvirt, I guess, you know, and or a specific load balancer, then then the tree would take you, would have maybe a list of suggested which guide to follow. And that would be like... Rather than trying to structure the guides based on that, because I I think we're we're only going to have like maybe four real guides, maybe you know total, um, and then it, like with Home Lab there were three three different you know approaches to it, and we can call them approaches right um, there. But I think the taxonomy that you're describing in my head. That's the decision tree about which guide to take a look at. Um, you know, which one fits fits you best, but realize it's not using the load balancer you want, right? Yeah, with a lot of the guides, you can actually uh, swap things in and out. They're not that critical to the guide. It's just that somebody made a choice, and it works, at least for this week. And uh, but there were other choices that were possible without making a major change to the guide. So, so I, I think what you're, you're describing is a guide to the guides. Maybe. Yeah, and maybe eventually it's um, once we get the baseline guides in, or a way to restructure the guides. But I, I, I don't I hesitate to um, redo all of the guides as we have them now in chunks. Like that, like, yeah. But that, I, that's me. I and and I am not a documentation specialist. I'm just trying to get the guides in the right place with enough information and expiry dates that we can um, move forward a little bit. Um, and you know, and right now everything just at the blog post that I'm writing is going to link to Mike's repo. Um, and a bunch of YouTube videos, which isn't super effective um, and not really maintainable over the long run. So um, we love Mike's repo. Um, <laughs> I I was just I totally appreciate it, um, but I'm a little I'm a little confused at this point because like I think maybe you know some of my intentions when originally creating that those you know notes as we called them back then. And maybe where this is going are, are out of sync here. So, like, if I understand correctly, Diane, 
what you'd like to see eventually in those guides is material like what Charo created, like a full walkthrough of how someone could do an installation. Is that is that what you're thinking? It it would be lovely if all of them were that verbose and that detailed. I don't expect all of them to be that verbose, and, and, but it would give an opportunity for other community. Like if somebody wasn't as verbose as that, they could make a pull request and add verbosity um, and detail. So like if someone um, just put a one liner in there, use you know I, I, F5's load balancer, um, and someone else would say, or use the one that come, you know, this other one, whatever. But what I'm, my goal is, is, is not just verbosity, but it's giving people a place to put their guides um, as well with some guidance about what makes a good guide um, and an expiry date. Um, you know, so, so no, no, not everybody is going to be as verbose as Charo. Um, and I don't want it to be a replacement for the OpenShift docs or docs.okd.io. So I'm not expecting, you know, superhuman efforts. Um, and as I, I'll go back to the beginning of this conversation, one of the things that I'm trying to do is drive people to come to okd.io for content, blog, be it blogs or these kinds of guide, community guides. Um, and but I don't know if that really helps you, um, but it it does to some extent. I mean, like the the other thing though, I mean, I have to be completely transparent about like why we created that repo and what our intentions were when we created it. And this is why we called it notes originally, because we really wanted to capture. You know, we're we were addressing a problem that we're seeing internally, which is that you know, especially for things like vSphere. Um, Users have an incredible number of options that they can exercise when deploying their cluster. And, um, you know, as someone who is kind of on the front line of debugging a lot of these things, it's really difficult for us to find good examples of how, like, someone, like I said, might have installed vMotion in their cluster and they're using it, right? Yeah. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to just create a place where people could put notes about, like, all right, I'm doing a UPI vSphere installation and I'm using vMotion for all the disk images that I'm using. So like, here's the hardware that I had set up and like, here's a couple notes on what I had to do to get vMotion working. So we weren't necessarily trying to get like full, like front to back, like install the whole cluster guides. We wanted just a place where someone could go and say, well, I'm thinking about doing a home lab, let's say, and I wanna use this type of hardware. What, what, how much will I need? And they could look at one of those guides and just say, well, I'm going to need six machines and they're each going to have to be four core and eight gigs of RAM or, you know, whatever. Someone could just look very quickly and figure out, like, what would they need to start doing this, right? Um, so that was kind of our original intentionality. Like, I'm, I'm, I think it's interesting what you're talking about in terms of having these richer guides there. That's awesome content. It's just, it's a lot to ask people to kind of, you know, create when they're coming. Yeah, so, and, and this may be at odds with what everybody else is. So the way that I vision it is rather than Craig Robinson writing a Medium blog post and Charo doing wherever his is and, you know, and Bruce, you know, finding something in Kubernetes cluster laptop sysadmin blog somewhere on Red Hat, that this would be the home for that, that we would require some basic things like date timestamps, a release version, the assumptions, hardware requirements, target audience, and, and I just added a thought of, and maybe a link to a video walkthrough of your deployment there as, you know, if it's available, um, and as much verbosity as you can um, with, and, 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 that, and that, I think, and then, and then we can also, when a new release comes out, say, this has been depreciated. You know this no longer works you know or and then then we could also add in you know maybe in the guide um the way that i think this is the way diane thinks as an appendix of like notes about v motion you know or you know things like that but what i want to first get is the ones that we have i want to get the verbosity of that blog post in there with these minor thing you know details about 
the date and timestamp, the release version, assumptions, hardware, target audience, and any links there added in. So some of them have it. And stop having, and not, I don't want people to stop writing medium blog posts. This is not what I'm saying, but I'm like, that drives, you know, that's wonderful. And I'm about to do a blog post um, talking about those three home lab things, um, including Craig's and that, and so that people drive people to watch that video. And I want to be able to link back to something at the moment in Mike's repo that um, has references home lab, right? Um, so that's that's where I'm coming from, and nothing in your repo right now does that. You have a bare metal thing, and you don't have the single node thing. So those those little structural things, I would love to see that done in the next couple of days, so that I could put a blog post out and on OpenShift.com and on um, OKD.io that drives everybody to OKD.io and to this. And the sooner we can get it out of me, Mike's repo into okd.io, um, the more one will be able to track who's contributing um, as opposed to contributing to OKD versus contributing to Mike's repo, which is important to me as a community person, um, and also give credit uh, to folks. And then, you know, if Mike gets hit by a bus and Diane gets hit by a bus, okd.io still lives on. And Diane is not planning for either of those things to happen. Um, but I, I also think that, yeah, so so my short-term ask of Mike, and because we get seven minutes left, is to look at what you have there, get the structure of the guides to reflect at least at the bare minimum what we used for the workshop, right? And maybe move Vadim's and Shree's and Craig's notes into the home lab one and Charo's into the single node cluster one. And if you have the time, um, put in those um, date timestamps, release version, metadata tags in there. Um, and then when you get to that point, maybe that's next week we look at it at the, the Tuesday meeting for the OKD working group. Or prior to that, if you would like, we can lift and shift it into the OKD.io. So it'll be running in parallel for this week. And then May, what I would like to do is I'll hold off on doing the post on the Home Labs blog post until the Wednesday after next week's meeting to make sure everybody's happy with the move from Mike's repo to okd.io and that we've done it well. Um, and so that's my goal. By, by next week to have it moved out of Mike's repo with some semblance of structure that matches the workshop. Um, and Eric, if you want to weigh in and, and help um, him with the home lab one, uh, not the home lab, but the single node cluster one, um, that would be great. And Bruce, since you were sitting through all of Charo's stuff, that one fits it. And Robert, you are a guinea pig external viewer of this to see if we got the structure right. How is that? That's good. All right. So I. I okay, so what were you asking me to do, Diane? I'm asking you to be a reviewer, a cynical, reviewer, okay. what did you ah, say, that's it, that's fat, it. happy, and, and, and whatever with the other one word was. And uh, yeah, fat, dumb, and happy. Yeah, there you go. Um, Depending on the day, I emphasize one of those more than the other. But Yeah, and, and then, you know, and the ask of you is, Bruce, is to, to really to maybe make a, just a gist file for next Tuesday's meeting that is a taxonomy of um, where to point people to. Like, think of it in terms of if, you know, if then else, if you're using a cloud provider, you, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, so, so some of the things I'm suggesting are more long-term, okay, so I'm, I'm not trying to get in the way of the short-term, so don't yeah. don't get me wrong on that, you know, like, if we never get the short-term accomplished, we never get to the long-term. Uh, yeah. But, but I, don't, uh, sure. I want to cap capture that workflow, the decision tree there that you're talking about, because I think it's important um, and even if that, to start with, Bruce, is just a, um, a blog post on okd.io, to use mm -hmm. Joseph's mechanism for how to make a decision about which guide to use or, you know, what are some of that. That, I think, is important um, to capture. Um, and, and I think it is a good chapter in the guides. 
Yeah, I will get um, Charo to change that, um, Robert. Yeah, I think that's just, um, I don't know what. But I, I don't know what some, of the, some of the stuff is not obsolete as quickly as you might think. If you can, in other words, like in theory, I could install 4.4 .4 and then update it. Yep. Okay, now I haven't actually tried that, uh, but, uh, you know, because, I mean, if things get too stale, it's you can't update it anymore. But it doesn't have to be in the latest and greatest as long as it still works and you get something which is updatable. Okay. And um, Robert and Eric are both um, pointing out a good thing is um, what license are we going to put all this under? And let's bring that one up at the um, meeting next week. And I will um, poke Charo about it between now and then about why why he chose GPL3. I, I don't know. Um, and if, if that's a stopper. But as Eric points out, it's text. And maybe we just need to put Creative Commons there somewhere. Um, but yeah, that is a conversation we should have next week. So um, we have three yeah, minutes. I Go I was going to say, I had a similar thought to Eric's when I was looking at the Apache license. I was, I originally just put the Apache license in there because I knew it would be, yeah, I think like a CC by SA or something would probably work for everything there. Um, yeah, Charo's GPL3 notwithstanding. Um, Diane, like I, loud and clear, I hear what you're saying. I, I'll try to get all these changes made, um, you know, before next Tuesday so we can review it at the meeting. Uh, I think, you know, most of this stuff should be straightforward. I'd like to change a little bit of the language in the README and kind of update it to make it more user friendly. Um, and I'd also like to put readmes in the subdirectories so that we can help index better what people are seeing there. So that just if people come and look, they have an idea of what's going on. Um, I, writing, rewriting some Acharo stuff is going to be like difficult. Um, but, you know, maybe we can just kind of Maybe if we pull out some of the information about like the requirements and whatnot, we can put that in there and then leave the instructions as like a rich link back to, you know, the work that that he has there. So we're not really like stepping on his toes. Yeah. So what I, I what I really like to do is, and, and the same with Craig Robinson is, like like putting in a link a, a link in the template as a link to the a video walkthrough, a link to the original source. So that people get cross reference and we get some flow going back and forth. I, this isn't to replace a Medium blog post or an OpenShift.com or the, even the, the sysadmin blog post that Bruce shared with us. Um, those things we can cross link, grab, grab some of it with um, as long as we reference them. And um, yeah, and, and then whoever that dude was on the sysadmin one, he'd better come over and, and help write up his. Uh, so there. There you go. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in I'm gonna, one minute, I got that. I got the additional links, though. I'll put that. I'll make sure those are in there as well. Okay. And people are going to join in about two seconds. I'm going to stop recording now.